Hi, everybody. I'm Eugene. Uh, I work on the Google Cloud Dataflow and Apache Beam teams. I've been doing that for a few years, and I think it's a pretty good piece of work. So now I'm going to give you a really quick overview of the several core things that one needs to know about Beam. Uh, first, a little bit of history. It originated uh, back in 2004 uh, when Google created MapReduce, which was a distributed data processing programming model. But at its core, it's really just a huge select and a huge group by, and nothing more. Uh, it just does it really well in a distributed and fault-tolerant fashion. It evolved in two directions. Pretty quickly, people realized that uh, one select and one group by is not that useful, and it's better to build a high-level API where you can build whole graphs made of that. And that's, how, that's what Flume Java did. And that is also the programming model familiar probably to people who use Spark or Flink. So pretty much all uh, distributed data processing frameworks are in some way based on these two primitives, parallel apply and parallel group by. The other direction in which it evolved was Millwheel, a streaming processing system also created inside Google, whose focus was to disrupt the idea that streaming data processing has to be approximate. Millwheel aimed to make it deterministic and exact. Uh, and the core idea behind that was to do computations based on the absolute time when certain events happened as opposed to when this particular processing pipeline saw them. Then in 2014, these things were unified into Cloud Dataflow, which unified batching streaming under one programming model that I will explain soon, because Beam uses that programming model. And uh, Dataflow from the beginning aimed to become portable between different runners. So uh, the point was that you can't, you can run these pipelines on more than just Dataflow. And in 2016, this culminated in the creation of Apache Beam, which is a top-level Apache project uh, with an open ecosystem. It's uh, not critically dependent on any particular vendor. For example, less than half of the committers are even from Google, uh, and it's community-driven. So this is just a high-level context, uh, and um, this is an example code uh, with Beam. Uh, it should be pretty readable for anybody who used any data processing framework. So I'm not going to go into too much detail in, into it. There is two concepts. There is collections, which represent logical sets of data but don't really contain the data. And there is transforms that take collections as input and produce collections as output. Uh, simple enough. <clears throat> um, so all Beam pipelines are composed of three primitives. Uh, there is parallel do, which simply applies a function parallel to every element. Uh, there is parallel group by that takes a collection of elements and groups them by a key and produces a collection of groups that share the same key. Uh, and these can be grouped into higher level abstraction units by composite transforms. The three pillars of Beam that I would like to talk about uh, in this talk are, first, its unified programming model that erases the distinction between batch and streaming data processing, the portability, which is uh, perhaps even more disruptive. It is the idea that you can program pipelines in a mixture of languages and run them in a mixture of backends. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Beam's role in the data processing ecosystem as a whole. First, the unified model. The premise behind the unified model is that batch processing doesn't really exist, meaning that when people do batch processing, it's practically always part of a higher level streaming workflow, so we might as well model it as such. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about just one aspect of the unified model that really needs clarification. So the idea that batch processing doesn't exist comes from the fact that almost, you, almost always people have some sort of continuously growing input data set, and they want an output data set that represents a function of the input, and the input grows, and the output evolves, and the pipeline's job is to compute updates to the output data set. The key point is that new data can always arrive. Um, as a remark, uh, data that grows is always naturally temporal. So new elements appeared at some point. So all data in Beam has a timestamp, and this is the timestamp when the data logically was created. For example, when the user clicked on the link, as opposed to when this pipeline saw this product buff that says the user clicked a link. It is really important because it lets you define sensible semantics uh, independent on the execution details. Um, let's see how this programming model applies to these two primitives. Uh, for pardo, it's pretty trivial. Uh, when new data arrives, you just apply the function to it, and, and you're done. As for aggregation, it's a little more challenging, because normally you would say that you group all elements with this key, and you say, here's the group. 
Uh, but in this setting, there is no, never such a thing as seeing all elements for a particular key. So we need to define it in a more general way. Let's talk about that, because this is really the only thing that, that presents a problem for people learning BIM, how BIM does that. Uh, the idea is that um, BIM buffers data per key. So the group by key operation takes a collection of key value pairs and emits a collection of pairs of key and multiple values. Um, if you mentally partition this by key, you can think of it as a collection of buffers, where for each key, values arrive, and sometimes we emit groups of values to the output when we think that we've seen enough. Uh, we will never see all of them, uh, but we might at certain moments decide that we've seen enough to, to emit some, ing some intermediate aggregation result. So um, think of it this way. Uh, the, this arrow is the axis of event time, this is not the wall clock time that passes. This is a logical axis of when things happen. And new events arrive in, or sort of rain onto this axis and arrive at different times and arrive onto different points on this time axis. And uh, occasionally, results come out. A more complete formalism for this is called streams and tables. And I highly recommend this presentation, I think, by Tyler about modeling beam in this stream, streams and tables theory. Uh, but uh, at a high level, we have a stream of inputs and a stream of outputs and some controlled way to decide when to emit the outputs. Let's look at this in still more detail. So this is um, slightly convoluted, but this is the exact mechanics of what happens with aggregation in beam. When a data point arrives uh, for a certain key with a certain value and a certain timestamp, uh, we apply the idea that when you're dealing with temporal data and when you're aggregating it, you also almost always want to aggregate it uh, into time buckets. You rarely need the aggregation over, like, since the beginning of time. If you want that, that is possible too. There is the so-called global window. Uh, but generally, you want every element to, compute, to contribute to aggregations in multiple windows. For example, you might use fixed windows or overlapping sliding windows, or you might use session windows, uh, and so on. Uh, the key point is that every element contributes to one or more windows, and each of the windows internally has a buffer of elements that have been contributed to it, elements that, have, that sort of belong into this window. And inside each window, uh, there is a little machine called a trigger that decides what to do with the new elements. When a new element arrives, uh, we perform one of three actions. Either we drop the element, if the element is way behind, for example, uh, we received data that, that maps to a window that, was, that closed a year ago, uh, and we decide that this is the kind of data we just want to ignore. Uh, so in some cases, we may just drop the data. Uh, that, this, that is called late data. We can add it to the buffer and do nothing else yet, or we can decide that we have accumulated enough data for this key and window and say, OK, here's the next group for this key and window and the pipeline will do something with that group. Um, that is pretty much it, uh, except there is one more detail, uh, the so-called watermark. Uh, watermark is a continuously increasing estimate of um, how old data do we think we're going to see. Uh, it has to be provided by the data source, uh, because in general there is no way to estimate what data is going to come but some data sources are able to provide this sort of estimate. Uh, and uh, Beam can make use of this estimate. For example, if the, if the watermark says that it's quite likely that no data is going to arrive before an hour ago, then we can emit the results in all windows older than that. So together, we have these mechanics going on. And as new data arrives, uh, it either gets buffered or discarded, or aggregation results get computed and emitted. This is the core of the Beam model. Um, it is the subject of a lot of uh, misunderstanding, but I'm hoping that uh, this explanation will clarify it. OK. Um, so the key idea is that uh, the key idea behind Beam's unified model is that there is no distinction between batch and streaming. These terms do not even exist in Beam's programming model. There is no such thing as a batch data set or a streaming data set. There is just a, a collection. Uh, the only the thing that we perceive as the distinction between batch and streaming is different ways to control aggregation of data and different ways to decide when we think that we've seen enough. 
OK. Um, the next core pillar of Beam is its portability. And here I'm going to present Beam's vision. Uh, it is not 100% of that yet. The work is on track to be completed by the end of 2018. Uh, but I'd like to give a sense of where we're going. Uh, we're going to a world where you can program pipelines in any, uh, in any language that has a Beam SDK. Uh, currently, that is Java, Python, and Go. And new languages can, add, can be added in the future. There is also a Scala SDK uh, created by Spotify. All that gets translated to a portable pipeline representation. And that representation can be run by any Beam runner, of which there are currently, I think, nine. Uh, some examples are the Spark Runner, Flink Runner, Google Cloud Dataflow, Local Runner. Uh, so the thing is that you can program in any of these languages or a mix and run it on any runner. This has a number of obvious and less obvious advantages. First, there is the obvious advantage that you're not locked in uh, into using any particular runner. For example, suppose you have a Flink cluster, and later you'll run some Beam pipelines on it, and then you decide that, actually, I don't really like how my Flink cluster is handling that, I'm going to check out Spark. Uh, and maybe you like Spark, maybe you check out Dataflow and like it even more, uh, all that without modifying your pipeline. Um, the, other, uh, the other benefit is that there is no language lock-in. And by that, I mean that you don't have to commit to a particular language before authoring your pipeline, because you can use transforms written in any language from any other language. For example, you can be primarily a Python programmer. Um, and uh, are we completely out of time or almost? One more. OK. So um, there is no language looking, and uh, there is no language looking for library authors either. And also, this gives sort of linear rather than quadratic speed of growth for combinations of runner and language. For example, adding the capability to run Go on Flink is free once you have a Flink runner and a Go SDK. So I think that is really important. Um, that's pretty much it about portability. And uh, this is just a map of the Beam ecosystem from the lowest levels to the highest. There is a number of runners. There is the model. There is various languages and families of libraries and various ways to program Beam, like SQL, third-party SDKs. And uh, there is, you can, on top of that, there is user code, or there are products, like whole products and businesses and services bu built on top of Beam. Tyler is going to talk about one of them. And there is a number of others for data preparation. Um, and on top of that, there is, of course, the Beam community, um, which I found to be incredibly friendly and welcoming. So I encourage you to join it. Um, that is pretty much it. So with that, I invite you to listen to Tyler's talk uh, that comes after mine. And he will talk about Beam applied to machine learning. Thank you.